live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering NAB 2017. Brought to you by HGST. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here at theCUBE. We're at NAB 2017, again with 100,000 of our, of our friends. It's a crazy, busy conference. I think it's got three halls, two levels on each hall. More stuff than you could ever take in in four days, but we're going to do our best to give you a little bit of the insight, and we're going to go down a completely different path here with our next guest. We're really excited to have Linda Tadich on. She's the founder and CEO of Digital Bedrock. Linda, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Happy to be here. Absolutely, so for those that aren't familiar with your company, give us a little bit of, a, of an overview. Well, what we do at Digital Bedrock is we provide the managed digital preservation services that are required to keep digital content alive. Okay, so managed digital preservation. Yes. Okay, so what does that mean? Manage, meaning that we do the work for you. You just have to give us the files and we take care of it, so you don't have to license software, you don't have to train people, you don't have to purchase all the infrastructure, no big CapEx, we just do the work for you. We're their staff and infrastructure. Okay. Digital, meaning it's all digital content any format, any kind of content, we don't care. Um, and then preservation, and so what that means is keeping the content alive so it can be used in a hundred years, let's just pretend about that. Right. And that's not just storing it, because that means you have to know everything about how that file was created, so that you can monitor obsolescence, because digital files will become obsolete over time. So it's a, it's a really different kind of spin, uh, mm -hmm. because we're here in, in the HG, uh, HGST booth, and mm -hmm. a lot of talk about storage, or storage people mm -hmm. all around us, but when you talk about archiving and, present, and, and preservation, mm -hmm. how do you delineate that from just, you know, it's a backup copy, I know I have a backup copy on a server right. someplace. Yeah, so the preservation part of it is so, yeah, it has to live somewhere. I mean, the bits have to live on something. Right. And so it can be spinning disk, it can be solid state, it can be tape. And so storing it is the easy part, actually, but then the hard part is the managing it. So you want to make sure those bits are okay, that the bits are healthy, and so you will be doing fixity checks over time, according to a schedule. And then you want to also make sure that the file formats themselves. So everybody's concerned about migrating the data onto other storage media in the future, because you just have to do that at end of life, you, right, know, you have to right. move things along. But it's those formats that can become obsolete over time. Which means, let's say you have a format, a specific format, which requires a software to render it, which requires an operating system for it to run, which requires a chip or a, a piece of hardware or a file system to run. So what you have to do is you have to monitor all those vulnerabilities in order to keep that format alive. To know that if you have to need to migrate it or you can emulate it or use another software, there's something, or you can do nothing and just keep the bits alive until you can do something with it. So you do those things. So you'll, if there's a new file format that comes out next year at NAB, mm -hmm. that's the new preferred Mm -hmm. uh, whoop de whoop de format, you'll, you'll take some of those assets that you have in your mm -hmm. protection mm -hmm. and go ahead and recreate them in, in whatever feels like a viable right. format going forward? Yeah, actually we don't do that. We don't do the transcoding work. What we do is we monitor it in our, we have a separate database that's tacked into our core database. Okay. It's called the Digital Object Obsolescence Database, or the DUDE is what we call it. <laughs> it's a pretty <laughs> critical <good> thing, <laughs> the DUDE. <laughs> so in the DUDE, it's monitoring all of those, you know, what version of a software can be used to, you know, be able to render a file. So if something in our database suddenly is flagged as being, uh-oh, this is not a, is endangered now because one of those vulnerability factors has now been deprecated, we'll notify the client and we'll say, you have all of these files that you've given us to preserve that are now in danger. And so, but we can't just do the immediate transcoding because you know that those digital objects also then have perhaps these underlying files that feed up into that object. If you right. change one of those subsidiary files, you can't then render that final object. And so we have to be very careful not to just suddenly flip something and change it. Right. So we tell the client, here's your files and here are the relations between all the files. So, and here's what you can do to migrate it or to keep it alive. Uh, but we won't do that work for them because they probably can either do it themselves, they have to choose first of all what they want to do, or they might have a preferred vendor themselves who will do that work for them. Right, right. Yes. Um, and the other piece you talk about a lot in, uh, in doing some research before, before we sat down mm -hmm. is the metadata and how important the metadata is. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of conversation about mm -hmm. metadata, especially in mm -hmm. media and entertainment because there's the asset itself, but you need all this other information. So I mm -hmm. um, wonder if you can give us kind of the 101 on <laughs> metadata uh, and why it's so important and, and maybe not, not necessarily just the one-on-one, -on -one, but something a little bit more advanced and that mm -hmm. people don't think about when they think about metadata. Right, well I would say that most of the folks here at the event, at NAB, they're thinking about metadata in two ways. One is the description, which is describing the content. So what is the nature of this content? What is it about? What's in it? You want to search for a particular scene, a particular clip, and that's based on the content. They're also maybe thinking about technical metadata, but technical metadata in the sense of interoperability with machines. 
you know, and so you want to know that this software can work with this or with this system or whatever, and that's, or this camera can then work with a certain system, and that's all because of the technical metadata behind the scenes. What they're not thinking about then is the metadata that is required to keep that content alive. And that's all that those obsolescence factors that I was meaning. And in order to monitor all that obsolescence as we do in the dude, is where you need to be able to validate a particular format. Right. And you know immediately, yeah, this was shot with this camera and it's a certain kind of raw format, it's this version of it, which can only be used in this particular system. A lot of complex variables that are moving yeah. very, very quickly. A lot of metadata, yeah. I mean, in a typical bit of technical metadata we extract off a file, I mean, we'll get over 400 bits of metadata, and that's not even the descriptive metadata. 400 bit, 400 different 400 classifications different elements of, of, of elements. metadata. And we just pull it off the file. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and if that's not complicated enough, we were talking mm -hmm. a little bit before we turned the cameras on about, mm -hmm. about virtual reality. Yeah. And a whole yeah. different way mm -hmm. of really describing that experience. Probably mm -hmm. experience is a better word than asset because mm -hmm. there is no asset until you engage with what the software yeah. is feeding into your, into your experience. It's kind of virtual metadata when you come to think about it because it's like, you know, so there's the code, you know, that creates the software for the virtual reality to all work, and it's all required, but the actual experience then is what the human, the person who's using the software and how they're interacting with it. And so that metadata about your experience and the content is in your head. Right. You know, unless you're recording it as you're going, your experience. And right. so then there's an output of it, but otherwise it's all in your head and your experience. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. And then the other piece that we've heard a number of times here is, especially now with all the different uh, content distribution methods, you know, mm -hmm. there's many, many flavors of the, of the same mm -hmm. file. So yeah. are you keeping track of all the different variants as yeah. well? Yeah, and then if like, and so in fact in the research for like the dude, because it's humans who are doing the research to add the data to the dude, and they'll say, okay, great, this one software works with all these different operating systems, except for this one package that went out. So somewhere in the middle, so we can't even say this range from here to here, right. that will work with it. Right. Oh no, there's always an exception. Right in between. Right. So it's right. very complicated. So it's complicated yeah. and expensive and a lot of versions. Yes. And storage yeah. is getting cheaper every day, but it's mm -hmm. not free. Right. And managing is not free. Right. So it begs the value question. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can mm -hmm. bring up all kinds of sad tales of, of mm -hmm. phenomenal assets that were lost yeah. in the past. But how are people thinking about mm -hmm. the value of these assets so that they feel mm -hmm. comfortable making the investment in this preservation and archiving. Yeah, two things, two different mindsets I think that people have to just start adjusting to. One is they're just creating so much data, they need to start doing appraisal and retention policies on them. You can't save everything, you shouldn't have to save everything. Right, right. So that means and you should really, in reality, set those policies at the point of when you're shooting, when you're creating it, so that it's automated, so it's not that at the end of a huge project when you have a petabyte of data there, then that's not the time to just choose what right, you want right. to keep. You need to set that policy in advance and try to automate so it. So their best practices, I mean, what are some of the best practices, or are there some reference points that people should kind of start from, I guess? I think the bottom line that they should be thinking about is let's say that in 100 years, so thinking about uh, Paramount, Paramount just had its 100 year anniversary, and they were able to go back to their original nitrates and do digitization, and they're showing films that were made 100 years ago. So what about the content being created now? What if in 100 years you want to be able to have your own 100 year retrospective? What would you need in order to be able to render the files that you're creating now in order to show it then? Right. So what elements do you need to keep in case you need to restore it or recreate it? it um, so that's one thing you have to think about. That just crazy. feels like it could be a complete rabbit hole though. It could be. So that's why you have to think about the bottom line, 100 years. Now of course, 100 years, who knows? Because right. of all of this artificial intelligence and all of this automated capture, then there could be just systems that will just recreate it right, for you. Right. So you might, you know, I'll be out of business. You know, right. as I call it, the virtual Linda, I'll be out of a gig in 100 years, you know? <laughs> so this is a fascinating uh, area. How did you get involved in, in, this, in this area? Um, I started out as a creator, so I was a composer and a filmmaker way back when, um, but then I got into the archival community, archival field. So I've been working in audiovisual, film, video, audio, and then digital, really starting 2000, all my work's been in digital formats, and doing that preservation because all of this content is important to me, and I'm, 
it's like whether it's your own personal home videos or images of your kids when they were born, right, right. you know, it's all digital or whatever, to a studio product, a, stu a station, government documents, it doesn't really matter. If that content is important to you, it should be preserved because it documents your personal history, it documents our cultural history, right. it documents you know, governments for going forward, for evidence, for law enforcement, all of that, if it has to be preserved, you have to really focus on that and how to keep it alive. And it's all important and that's right. how I got into it. Right, and, and as you spoke, you're involved in some really interesting cultural heritage uh, preservation, which is a completely yeah. different kind of value chain than yeah. a movie or my home video of, of the kids. Yeah. I wonder if you can kind of talk us through that, that use case that you described uh, earlier, because this sure. is a very different way to think about virtual mm -hmm. reality, preservation, and digital assets. Yeah. So, so I also do some consulting work and I'm working with this organization in Dunhuang, China, which is in the western part of China. So that's out in the Gobi Desert, far out. So what this organization is in charge of are these caves that were created by Buddhist monks starting in 364 AD, going up to around 1100 AD. Hundreds of caves out in the desert carved out of sandstone and the monks would then paint, you know, murals and beautiful, incredible murals showing like, you know, Buddhist culture, history, and the culture of the time. You can see how people lived, how they farmed, because they had that representation on the murals. Right. So the Dunhuang Academy, they came to me and they said they're doing digital capture of the caves, high res capture of the murals. And they said, Linda, these caves are 1,500 years old. We know they will not be around in 1,500 years. So these digital assets must be around in 1,500 years because those will be the only representations of these caves right. that are there. So I'm helping them build a digital repository to keep those digital images alive. Because it, they are, they consider them to be the embodiment of the caves. Right. So I think that I've seen some great examples of virtual reality um, implementations in the cultural heritage environment. Again, thinking about some of these critical places around us in, in the world and the environment. They won't be around in 1500 years either because humans have destroyed them you know, through the environment or just natural deterioration and destruction. Right. So what virtual reality can do is go out and capture those environments, capture those sites, so that we can experience them or people can experience them when those sites are no longer around. Right. If the humans are still around. Right, right. Fascinating, and what a great what a great application of, of virtual reality. Yes, absolutely. It's my favorite, and enter entertainment is fun right. to pretend you're somewhere, but it's that, just to go to a different site, to right. go to a different right. place. All right, so I'm going to, shift gears a little bit, as you've done all this archiving, you look at these old movies, because we hear it mm -hmm. at NAB, and it's all about media entertainment. I was curious if you have any kind of historical perspective of how mm -hmm. the storytelling has changed over time. Mm -hmm. Is there a consistent thread that you see, excuse mm -hmm. me, or um, <clears throat> just reflection as you've spent mm -hmm. so much time with this historical archive footage mm -hmm. uh, that you could share with the audience that Maybe uh -huh. we'll get them to go look at things, <clears throat> excuse me, that aren't opening you know, this weekend at your local mm -hmm. Cineplex. Uh -huh. Well, just thinking about, okay, so think about film. So film in the early days was basically just a representation of theater because that was the moving art form of the time. Right, and right. so it was really static, just a one camera standing there and people would act in front of the camera. And then of course that changed, you know, what with D.W. Griffith and others doing all the intercutting and the show and then things happening at the same time in different locations. That was really radical in 1912, 1913, just over 100 years ago. You know, and then you go into like the golden age of cinema in the 30s and the spectacle and so it's more, and so now we're in the age of virtual reality where instead of we're being told a story, it's more like we are part of the story, right, you know, going right. through that. And we'll see how, if people still want to go back and return to tell me a story, you know, just as like when we're little kids, we all want to tell you a story, daddy, right, mommy, right. kind of thing. And so when we're there, maybe we want to be told that and, and, have, and just be engrossed in somebody else's story and relax our brains instead of feeling like, gosh, I just want to rest and relax. Do I have to interact with right, this Right, right, do I have to work? I, yeah, you know, I'd, I rather know. Have, I'd rather have somebody who's really good at it, like Quentin yeah. Tarantino, you know, yeah. tell me his interpretation of this story. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm really curious to see, you know, it's still new with virtual reality and augmented reality to see how it's going to really, you know, expand. Right, and if right. people, it might just be a fad. You know, I know people don't want to hear that. And, but it has all these other great uses. You know, it's a cultural heritage or in gaming right, and that kind of right. thing, it's totally fun. All right. But if for narrative, sometimes you just want a story. All right, well Linda, you're doing yeah. great work, so we have to let you get back to the booth so that more <laughs> people can take advantage uh, and, and, and keep track, and I, I think, the, the word that you used a number of times, mm -hmm. keep these things alive yeah. uh, for future consumption, yes. not just 
in cold storage in a vault someplace. Yes, absolutely. All right, well yes. thanks again, Linda, Thank for stopping you. by. Thanks so much, Jeff. All right, thanks. Linda Tadic, I'm Jeff Frick. We're at NAB 2017, you're watching theCUBE, and we'll be back after the short break. Thanks for watching.